Partridge has done some amazing and impactful work in the movie industry over the last three decades. Pirates of the Car special effects for Pirates of the Caribbean, uh, Back to the Future, Jurassic World, Pacific Rim, Transformers, big names, guys. So he has an amazing journey to get to where he is, and we are so fortunate enough to hear some snippets of that journey today from a major Hollywood special effects producer. Thank you. Um, i got to tell you, when Francis asked me to come and speak here, I said, who else is speaking? And he said, oh, we've got some TV celebrities and a whole bunch of extremely beautiful, extremely intelligent and talented uh, delegates from the Miss Asia Global uh, pageant. You'll fit right in, he said. <laughs> um, so thank you, Francis. But when I uh, saw what this conference was all about, I realized it wasn't my history and pageants that he wanted to hear about. Um, it was uh, the film industry. Because when you look at imagination, imagine an entrepreneurship, women's empowerment, and social impact. Pretty much describes the film industry at the moment. Um, lots of imagination. Every movie is an entrepreneurial endeavor. You put a company together, you create a, pro a project, a product, and you hope people want to go see it. Um, social impact. We all know lots of movies can have incredible social impact. And those are the kind of movies that I am interested in these days. And women's empowerment is a big issue in the film industry right now. We need to do better. It is improving, but it's a long way to go. And there's a project or two that I'm working on that is towards that end as well. So hopefully you'll find this talk relevant to today's subjects. And a lot of the things that I'll be touching on that have happened to me in my career have already been mentioned by people that I've been listening to eagerly all day. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I want to take you back 33 years uh, to the start of my career. I'm about three months into my first job. I'm about to give a speech uh, to 500 audio engineers. And I'm about 10 minutes in, and I pass out. I hit the floor. That wakes me up. Uh, they bring me a chair. I get up, and I finish my talk. What has that got to do with this presentation? Absolutely nothing. 
but I figured that this is the end of a long day, you've been listening to lots of speakers, that maybe it's worth hanging around for 10 minutes more because you never know what might happen. <laughs> so the subject today can be addressed by one slide and one quote by Biz Stone, the uh, co-founder of Twitter. Timing, perseverance, and 10 years of trying will eventually make you look like an overnight success. I think we've all heard those sentiments. I certainly have, and I agree with them. Um, so I would like to focus on five other more esoteric characteristics um, that I have uh, pers pursued during my career and that have helped me to achieve my own definition of success. Number one is to chase your dreams. But be careful to think clearly about what your dreams really are. Most of us have many, many dreams. We have dreams for our family, we have dreams for our finances, we have dreams for our career, we maybe have dreams to travel. Um, I saw somebody had a dream and fulfilled it to skydive uh, earlier on. Um, lots of dreams, but remember also that dreams can change. Certainly I don't long to be a train driver anymore. Um, so I recommend that you write down your dreams on a regular basis, review them annually, because if you don't know what you want, how can you possibly achieve it? My passions as a child were music and eventually movies. I didn't realize they were dreams for me to have a career in until much later, actually at college. And even then, they seemed completely impossible. I was introduced to movies by my mother, who took me to see The Sound of Music seven times at the theater when it came out. Uh, but her favorite film was Lawrence of Arabia. I think it might have had something to do with Omar Sharif, but what would I know, I was this big. Um, it became my favorite film too. But we never saw it together on the big screen. I was an infant when it came out, so she couldn't go to the theater. Uh, but when it came out later on TV, we're talking the 70s of course, so we had to wait for it to come out on TV. We would watch it every time it was shown and eventually we would get our VHS copy and uh, wear that thin watching it. And it really became my favorite movie. I just loved the spectacle that was in this film. <coughs> then of course, in 1977, this came out, which I definitely saw on the big screen multiple times. And it had an impact on a lot of people. <coughs> For me, it just looked like it was so much fun. And it was the first time, I was the kind of kid who wanted to see how things worked, how they were made. I would take things apart and put them together again and they'd never work again. <laughs> but I wanted to know, seeing this film made me think, well, what would it be? how do you make something like that? And what fun could it be to make something that ends up on the screen looking like that. I didn't seriously think that I could actually be involved in making things like this. I lived in the north of England, which is about as far away from Hollywood as Tatooine is. But there were people making these things. And I learned that my favorite films tended to be these big special effects action movies and there were actually, there's just a handful of the ones that were actually made just up the road here in a studio in San Rafael by Lucasfilm, Industrial Light and Magic. They made the special effects for all of these films. Who would have thought that 35 years later, I'd have my own special effects company based in the same studio working with the same people and making the next generation of Star Wars films in a very small way. So how did I achieve this crazy dream? Here are a few of the things that I think have stood me in good stead over the years. I've been willing to take chances, and I think everybody should and does in many ways. We're taking an awful risk, Lord, risk, Lord Vader. This had better work. Well, they don't always work. 
But you should be open to new opportunities, new challenges. In fact, go in search of them. If you stand in the middle of an ocean, well, you'll drown, for one thing, but you'll also only see the fish that swim by you. And there's a lot of beautiful and interesting fish out there that you have to go looking for. Push yourself. Push yourself out of your comfort zone. You may surprise yourself. Of course, you may also fall flat on your face, like I did at that first lecture I ever gave. Um, actually, I had the flu that week, and I was running a fever of 103, so it probably wasn't my best decision ever to stand up and make a presentation. Um, other times when you take a risk, you might find an idea that sends you down a completely new career path, which I did. I was at college studying music, and I just by chance heard of a lecture being given up in London by a film editor. I knew that I liked films, thought it might be interesting to learn a little bit more. This guy was called Terry Rawlings. He had just edited the Alien movie by Ridley Scott, and uh, after that was in the middle of doing Blade Runner. And Terry spoke about the importance of sound in movies, how it's at least 50% of the movie, and the importance of the role of a sound designer. Well, that was it for me. I loved sound and music. I was studying sound. And maybe this was the key for me to actually get into working on movies. While I was at college, we would frequently travel from up to London to record the orchestras in the venues in London. And we would always drive by this very mysterious building with dark windows and the name on the side, Dolby Laboratories. I had no idea what they did. I knew they were big in sound. And I began to recognize their logo appearing on cinemas and on movie posters. I thought, ha, there's a connection there, sound and movies and this company. So when I graduated and I saw uh, an ad in a trade <coughs> magazine for a sound engineer to work at Dolby Labs, I applied, I got the job, and six months later, I'm working on movies. I went on to work on over 100 movies in the over the next 15 years in over 20 countries, many movies in Asia. Um, and, uh, but I always really knew that the real action in movies and the movies I loved were the big movies made in the US. So I kind of had a dream to get involved there somehow. And when an opportunity came up within the company to move to the US, I jumped at it. I uh, came over here with my wife and three young children. And that was another risk chance that I took that worked out really well. I ended up running the whole film division and the broadcast division. Uh, and that at a time when the film industry was considering doing what every other industry had done, transition to digital. Now this was a huge endeavor. Imagine every cinema in the world would have to change, every studio in the world would have to change from physical to digital technologies. Now we of course have been very successful in audio, but this digital, mo digital cinema movement needed lots of new technologies, encryption technologies, and primarily digital video. But I saw a huge opportunity for the company to take a leadership position in this transition, except we were an audio company. I had to convince the company that we should become a video company. We did that, it was a big risk. We acquired a bunch of companies, some new technologies, but I had every faith in the team that we had that we could pull this off. And in 2005, um, we launched Chicken Little with D Disney in 84 theaters around the US. And now every theater around the world has converted pretty much to digital. So that was a great venture, a big risk that paid off. Like I said, they don't always work out so well. I was also a pioneer for 3D in Hollywood and in the process gave a lot of people a lot of headaches. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> um, so I ended up spending 25 years at Dolby. I ran the whole technology division. Um, I did the road show, which took the company public, uh, the biggest IPO of 05. Um, but after 25 years, I was ready for a change, another challenge, and I joined a small effects company. I was still pursuing my love of working on movies 
But it was pretty risky given the small size, the inexperienced management, and the business itself. And sure enough, it went bankrupt. But it gave me some great new friends, an insight into another aspect of filmmaking, and it also gave me a new dream to run my own business. So I started 3210 seven years ago, and we're still going <coughs> relatively strong. But if you take chances, you're bound to have some failures, but you learn from them, and you move on. This one may seem obvious. Play nice. Be easy to work with. Be a collaborator. Don't bring problems to your boss. Bring solutions. Be positive. Have your colleagues back. Don't be a backstabber, a blamer, a critic, a cynic, a jerk. Nobody wants to work with those people. You won't get invited to the meeting. You won't be in the room where it happens. And again, this seems obvious, but some people don't get it. Here's an email from a guy who doesn't get it. So I get an email maybe once, twice a week from people looking for a job. And ever since I've been in management, I always reply to every one of these requests. I know how soul-destroying it is when you reach out to a company and you don't get even a reply. So I always reply. Um, but we're not hiring at the moment, so it's, uh, um, I reply along these lines. So this guy wrote uh, an email to me. Uh, it was an unusual one. It was pretty short. It just said, any admin jobs, see attached. And he gave me his resume. All right, I'll reply. And uh, read his resume, nothing to do with the film industry. But he had some decent jobs and some decent skills. So I replied and said, thanks, David. Nothing here at the moment, but we'll keep your resume on file and good luck. Which was true. I kept it on file and you never know when I might dig into that file and need somebody on the admin side and talk to the guy. However, David decided to reply this way. <laughs> And this is all in capitals, so I assume that means he was kind of shouting. Just because it's a different industry doesn't mean I can't handle the, sorry, damn ass job. Don't wish me luck, bozo. The other guys don't want me neither. There's about eight spelling mistakes so far with this. I've been looking for four years. You don't know what, and I'm not going to say this, expletive I've been through. Don't wish me luck. Okay, well I won't, but I think you're going to need it. <laughs> Play nice. My next little bit of advice is find yourself a great team. I think the last speaker uh, um, or two said uh, it's all about the people you work with, and it really is. Nothing gets done by anyone on their own. You need a team pulling in the same direction. Everything's always done as a team effort. A great team can do great things when they're pulling the same direction and that direction is set by great leaders. My experience working at Dolby as an audio engineer and then running a division of 500 people um, was just like this. For example, in order to bring surround sound to the world we needed people like me working on the movies to create that sound, surround sound. We needed people in the cinema to install the equipment to replay that surround sound. We needed people in the factory to build that equipment. We had people talking to chip manufacturers. We had people talking to consumer electronic manufacturers to bring surround sound technology to the home. A huge team all pulling in the same direction with the same goal, which was to enhance the, the entertainment experience. My current colleagues uh, had a similar experience working on the image side of the business uh, in special effects. Uh, in the early days of industrial light and magic, they had incredible people all working together as a tight team, and literally, as you all know, they changed the way movies are made. As a small example of the teamwork that existed at ILM, first of all, you had to build the boat. Then you'd have to paint the boat. Then you'd have to put wind in the sails. Then you'd put explosives in the hull. Then you'd float the boat and blow it up. And the can you'd have a great cameraman to capture the images to create fantastic images like this and this. All about teamwork to create a great result.
So as a result of living by these principles, I've always loved what I've done. I played nice, and I've been afforded some amazing opportunities. I've taken risks, and I've learned some painful mistakes and lessons, but they've always expanded my horizons. I've worked in some great teams, I've built some great teams, and we've done some great things. I've also worked in some dysfunctional teams, and I know which I prefer. As a result, I've been able to fulfill many of my dreams. I've worked on films from James Bond films to Star Wars. I've worked from London to Shanghai. I've led large organizations, and now I'm leading my own small company. But I keep on dreaming, as you all should. My new dream is to bring filmmaking back to the Bay Area in a big way. So I'm looking for investors to do that with me. The Bay Area has always been a hotbed of fiercely independent and innovative filmmakers, from Chaplin to Pixar, with Coppola, Lucas, and Saul Zantz in between. And I think it can be again. The talent is here, the facilities are here. We can make this happen again. We can be North Hollywood. So to summarize, Know what your dreams are, first and foremost, and then chase them. Take chances. Failure is an option. Not only is it an option, it's inevitable. Learn the lesson, move on. Play nice. Don't write emails like this one. Find yourself or create for yourself great teams. It's all about the people you work with. If you're not in a great team, find another job. And do what you love. And if you can't do what you love, love what you do. I'll finish with one more story, and it goes back to Lawrence of Arabia. The more I learned about filmmaking and how incredibly difficult it is, the more I admired this film. More specifically, the more I admired the director of this film, Sir David Lean. He created these magnificent images without a single computer in sight. He became like a god to me. How could he possibly do this? And in 1989, I get a call from Steve Southgate, who's running the Columbia Studios office in London. And he asked me to go to help him to check the quality of a restored 70 millimeter print of Lawrence of Arabia. How excited was I? They were going to show the film down at the Cannes Film Festival in honor of Sir David Lean for his 90th birthday. So I go along to the theater, and there in the theaters, there's Steve, who I know well from Columbia. And who's with him? Sir David Lean, the man himself. The three of us watched that film, that magnificent film on a huge screen at the Odeon, Leicester Square. And every now and then, Mr. Lean would say, Ah, dear boy, now this shot here, and he would tell us how he made that shot. For example, this iconic scene of the arrival of Sheriff Ali, played by Omar Sharif, my by then departed mother's favorite, um, they fabricated a new lens for the camera just to shoot this scene. They called it the David Lean lens, and it was never used again. You see all these uh, fingers, of the, the black stones that look like fingers that are pointing towards that point on the horizon from where Sheriff Ali appears. David Lean told me that those stones were put there by hand. Imagine that. I like to think that there was a fourth person in the theater that day and she was sat right behind me, watching her favorite film on the big screen for the first time. Thank you. <laughs>